So this is the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. This is salvation from sin number six. This is part 36 in the doctrine of soteriology. Now, last sermon I gave, because it's been on probably a few weeks, uh, last sermon I gave, if you remember, we went through Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, about denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily, following Jesus. you got to fulfill the two first before you follow Jesus. If you won't do the first two, you can't follow Jesus. And if you remember, we went through Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 13, with that striving to enter in at the straight gate. And this striving is agonizing, showing you there's a fight to get in. The heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. This is the force, this is the violence that is acceptable before God. And of course, we compared those with several other different Bible scripture. Today we're going to conclude salvation from sin. And you can see in John chapter 1 that you're already opened up to. Look at verse 29. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus, this is John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, if the Lord Jesus takes away your sin, how do you still have sin? And no, this isn't a mystical, magical covering, like some might say, like John Piper, that, well, I still commit sin, but they're not on me. Like they just bounce off. I can't, that's so absurd. It's, 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 it's sad and comical at the same time. So absurd that somebody would say that. Now the Greek word has many different uses for taketh away. But it literally means, in this context, to carry off, carry away. Um, to take away from another what is committed to them. So he literally removes your sin. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, starting in verse 30. We're going to read a few verses here. It says, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Now this is, if you read the previous verses, Jesus is speaking, he is teaching. And notice it says, as he, Jesus, spake these words, many believed on him. So here you go, you've got believers, right? Notice the next thing Jesus says. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, my question would be, notice he says, if ye continue my word, then you're my disciples indeed. Did Jesus ever say we're all going to sin every single day because you're in this flesh and you can't help it? And No, it's nonsense. It's absurdity. Jesus never said such things. No, everything Jesus said, you're to do it. Which, by the way would include baptism. Figure I'd slip that one in there, contrary to popular opinion. Everything that Jesus said, you must do. Excellent. Go ahead. Something that I think it's saying here when it says many believe on him, I think this is when they um, talk about him being lifted up and that unless they believe that who he is, he is who he says he is, they're gonna die in their sins. So now they're believing that that uh, he's the savior. That's right. So now what? They had to continue his word of word, word of the words. Well, I go to Matthew 28. Um, Jesus says, uh, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So they need to continue in his word, which is first repent now because they're believing he's a son of God and you repent and you baptize and then there's, there's disciples. That's right. That's initial salvation. That's why Peter said that in Acts 2.38. First time you had a group of an assembly that was converted into following Jesus, it was repent and be baptized for what? For what? For remission of sins. 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let no man deceive you. I don't care who it is. The Bible says what it says. Don't be afraid to stand upon the truth. So notice, Jesus says you must continue in my word. Then you are my disciples indeed. So being a disciple of Jesus isn't just, I believe in Jesus, I, man, I believe what he just said. It's also doing what he says. Now notice their response in verse 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Notice they were appealing to their lineage. Don't you understand? It was given to us. From Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are free. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, literally meaning truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. This literally in the Greek means you are a slave to sin. Whosoever committeth sin, notice it's commit, it's not an ongoing process. If you commit one sin, is that committing sin? Sure is. And notice it says, whosoever. If you're claiming to follow Jesus, this applies to you. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And that servant, this servant, this slave that he was just referring to, abideth not in the house forever. What house? God's house. You will not remain. Why? Because at the very end, the separation comes. Because so many are deceiving them, themselves that they think they're okay with God. Right? Or maybe at one point in time in the past, they were right with God. Now they're lukewarm. At the end, what does Jesus do with the lukewarm? Vomits them out. Meaning he's going to expel you. You don't belong. So, verse 35, And the servant, that servant, abideth not in the house forever. The one that's committing sin, he abides not forever. But the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free from what? Committing sin. That's the context. He makes you free from committing sin. Praise be to the Lord, because that's what he does. There's power in the name of Jesus. Notice verse 37, he says, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. So he's correcting them. You think you're a child of God, because you're from the lineage of Abraham. However, you're not. You're of your father the devil. Verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Well, if you want some Bible verses, we're not going to turn there. You can write these down, but you should have them pretty much memorized. We've dealt with them several times. What are the works of Abraham? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 says that when God called him, he obeyed. And that correlates with Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. The very first time that God spoke to Abraham, I have a land for you, go. Paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. And what did he do? Did he wait around for three days? Jesus, don't you understand? You got to give it to me. You, you got to grant me repentance in the sense that you got to make me do it. No, he obeyed him from day one. Day one. He didn't wait around. You also have Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, where God himself was speaking to Abraham. And he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. Perfect. You can be perfect in Christ. Think about that. Now, you don't need to turn there. I just want to remind you a few things that we all need to be reminded of. If you think, well, I, I'm... I'm, I'm of Abraham. Don't you understand? I'm an Israelite. It's given to me. Well, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. I'm going to read it out loud. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is water baptism. See, people don't like that. So they're like, oh, that, that's Holy Ghost baptism. Well, compare that Romans chapter 6. You're buried with Christ by baptism into death. Romans 6 is not the Holy Ghost. Let no man deceive you. You'll never find in Scripture anywhere that you die receiving the Holy Spirit. You're put to death with Christ, buried with Christ by baptism into death. Then you receive the Holy Ghost. I'm certainly not saying you can't receive the Holy Spirit before baptism. I did, and I think many of you have. So what? That's called an ad populum argument. That proves nothing. It's amazing that people want to appeal to an ad populum argument, yet they use that against other people. Sinners say they have the Holy Ghost. Oh, I've got the Holy Spirit. Why don't I just go out there and, and, and tally up a vote of how many sinners out there say they have the Holy Ghost. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you have the Holy Ghost? Yeah, i got the Holy Ghost. That proves nothing. That's an ad populum argument. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, so tell me I'm not Abraham's seed. Go ahead. You're speaking against the Bible if you say that. Does that literally mean ethnically I become a Jew? No, I'm not an Israelite. However, I am the Israel of God. I am of Abraham. Does this mean that, oh, there's no men or women any longer? No, there's still men and women. There's different roles. Same with Jew and same with Greek. Same with Gentiles. But the law of Moses cannot save you, period. That's another gospel. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, you, like I said, you guys stay where you're at. I'm just going to read it to you. It also says in that chapter earlier on, it says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the same as the children of Abraham. Same. Same. No difference. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and these shall all nations be blessed. We just talked about that. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. All right? Now, I'm going to go back to John chapter 8 here. Look at that verse 51. Notice Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Does Jesus ever have one saying? that you're just a poor helpless sinner and you can't help it we all sin every day sins in your flesh Keith Wheeler's preaching a false gospel because he says that you that, that, that you can actually stop sinning don't you understand that's what Jesus said no you never see that Jesus never said anything like that no keeping his saying is well one saying would be what go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. John chapter 14. Starting at verse 21. We quote this, quote this so often on the streets because it's so powerful. I mean, it it's literally speaks for itself. It couldn't be any more clear. He that hath my commandments, Jesus' words, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, so you're keeping Jesus' commandments, he it is that loveth me. So how do you love Jesus? Keeping his commandments, that's right. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Wait a minute, are you telling me God the Father doesn't love everybody? Well, when you take the totality of Scripture, God is angry with the wicked every day, right? Right? God hates all workers of iniquity, right? But does God have a benevolent love for every single person, even the most wickedest person on earth? Absolutely. He's got a benevolent love. He wants the best for them. And they could be saved just like anybody else if they humble themselves, repent, and turn to Christ. But this is a, this is a sincere love, a relational love. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. 
You know, in the Greek there, that manifest, it literally means to manifest, exhibit, to view, to show oneself. Come to view, appear, be manifest. So how does Jesus come to you? Just by, I believe in Jesus because I believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. Like mentally, that's all you believe. No. Keeping his commandments. What's the first commandment to being a Christian? Well, first and foremost, count the cost, Luke 14. What's this, what's, after you've counted the cost and you're willing to follow Jesus, what's the next commandment? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But notice it's commandments. Everything after that, you obey. Everything that the Lord teaches you. Everything that he has said. Notice, after that, Judas, not Iscariot, it says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? I want to stop real quick. This really hit me this morning, how Jesus answers this. You know, when Jesus has answered me at times in my life, it's not like a simple yes or no. Have you guys experienced that? Yeah. It's like words of wisdom. So no, as we read the next verse, notice how he responds to that. But n notice Judas, not Iscariot, notice his thought process. Well, do you speak this to us Jews only and not, not the world? Notice, notice Jesus' response, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If, condition, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So he clearly tells you, first and foremost, if you're not keeping his sayings, everything he said, you don't love him. Period. And he tells you those sayings come from who? His Father God. And notice Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my words. All of them. Jesus never made an excuse for sin. That's salvation from sin. Because Jesus never told you to go sin. He told you to go and sin no more. But notice how Jesus answers. He doesn't say... Oh, well, Jesus, you've got it wrong. It's, it's for the whole world. The Jews first, but then it'll be the whole world. He doesn't answer like that. See, that, that's typically how a man would answer. Well, no, 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 it, it's for you guys first. Most of you are going to reject it, and it's going to be opened up to the whole world. But no, he didn't answer like that. He answered with profound wisdom. Notice, if a man, any, mankind, if a man, this would be anyone, anyone that meets that qualification. All right. Now we're going to compare this to many other Bible verses. Go with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5. We know this verse very well. We're going to read several verses here. We're going to compare all these verses here. We're going to compare because it correlates to John chapter 14 what Jesus said 1st John chapter 1 starting in verse 5 notice the Apostle John states this then is the message that we have heard of him Jesus and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all what does that signify darkness sin, sin that's right there's no sin in God if we say we have fellowship with him with Jesus and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, real quick, little side note. Somebody may say, well, I agree with that. I don't walk in darkness because I don't live in darkness. But, I, you know, we all still sin, but I'm not living in sin. I'm going to dispel that. Give me a few minutes. I'm going to use the Bible to dispel that. Okay? Let God be true and every man a liar. If we say we have fellowship with him, so you're claiming to be a Christian, and walk in darkness, we lie, you do not the truth. Notice the conditional statement of verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. So, you're walking with Jesus, in the light with Jesus. Jesus is in the light. Jesus never sins. So, likewise, you're in the light with Jesus, not sinning. That's the condition. 
We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So you have cleansing from all sin if you're walking in the light with Jesus, not sinning. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves The truth is not in us. So if you have sin, don't deceive yourself. Now this verse we've talked about before, it's primarily dealing with the Gnostic heresy. There were Gnostics going around saying, I don't have sin. There's no sin because my spirit remains pure. I'll put my 1 John 1.8 sermon in the description box underneath this video for YouTube if you want to listen to that. I, I dispel that to show that this is a dealing with Gnostics. But if you have sin, don't deceive yourself, right? Look at verse 9. He goes on. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's amazing people want to use 1 John 1.8. To say, see, we sin every day. We always got to have sin. Well, verse 7 says you're cleansed from all sin. Verse 9 says you're cleansed from all unrighteousness. So how can you still have sin? Exactly. You're not reading that correctly. If you have sin, don't deceive yourself. Confess it, forsake it. In the Greek, it's the Greek root word, homologeo. And homologeo literally means it's an agreement with God. So if you're agreeing with God, you're going to do what? Just go, I'm sorry, Jesus. No, you're going to repent. Confess and repent. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, go to the next chapter, 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Now, remember this walking in darkness. People like to say, well, I'm not, I'm not walking in darkness. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm, because, I mean, we sin every day, but I'm not living in it. They, they like to do that. I'm sure y'all have heard this. Well, yeah, I sin all the time, but I'm not. There's a difference between sinning and living in sin. Yeah. Really? Really? Okay. Right. Okay. Well, let's use the Bible. Starting at verse 9. He that saith he is in the light. Remember, these Christians are claiming to be in the light. And hateth his brother. Is, can you choose to hate your brother one time? Yes, this is a one-time committing of sin. Hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Okay, so he chooses to hate his brother and he won't repent. Right? Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness. So if you choose to hate your brother, you are now in darkness. You are now in sin. And walketh in darkness. Two distinctions there. You're in darkness. You have put yourself in darkness by choosing to hate your brother and now you walk in darkness because you won't repent. You're living in it. And knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. You become blind. That ought to be a wake up call for all of us. That is terrifying. If you do sin in the future, you better humble yourself, confess and repent because you might become blinded. And we've witnessed that, unfortunately, it seems recently. You will become blinded. So right there proves to you this nonsense of, well, I mean, I, I mean, I, yeah, we all sin. I mean, we sin every day, but I'm not living in sin. That's the epitome of living in sin. The devil sins every day, right? Go to 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Now, why would John say the whole purpose of writing this letter is to convey to you that you don't sin? If it's impossible to stop sinning. God doesn't command the impossible. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if, notice it's not when. That's a huge distinction. So many professing Christians, they're defeated in their own mind because they'll verbally profess, well, I'm going to sin. We can't, we're going to sin eventually. Well, if that's your mind state, you're already defeated. No, I actually believe I could go the rest of my life and never willfully sin again against God. What does that mean? 
I have full knowledge and I do not disobey the knowledge of God that I have. There's a distinction between willful and ignorance. We're always growing. And if a sign of ignorance is pointed out to me, and it is sin, now you become responsible before God. Now you confess and repent. John chapter 9, verses 35 through 41, and John chapter 15, verse 22. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say you see, therefore your sin remains. So remember that. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Literally just means appeasement. People will read that and say, oh see, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. No, the Father God was appeased by what his son did. It pleased him. That's it. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I, I know Jesus and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. So how do you know Jesus? You keep his commandments. If you don't keep his commandments and you say you know Jesus, you are a liar. You know, there's, actually, there's actual truth to the world saying, liar, liar, pants on fire. Liar, liar. Your whole body's going to be on fire. That's what's going to happen if you don't repent. God doesn't want that. He wants you to be saved, so repent. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Starting in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I know Jesus. I go to church. I'm a deacon. I'm a pastor. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, meaning your works, and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So how do you have assurance before Jesus and the Father? You're loving God in your, wait for it, I know it's a, it's a curse word today, works. Do I need to go through and beep that out of the video? Uh, it's like a terrifying word today. You love God in your works. In truth, in works. And that's how you know him. That's how you have assurance before him. Go to verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. So you receive what you ask if you keep his commandments. Now, by the way, to the, I think it's Word of Faith movement. See, whatever you ask, you want a million dollars? You just ask Jesus for a million dollars. You're going to get it, my God. Well, go to 1 John chapter 5. You need to ask according to his will and your heart, right? That's right, a right heart. But you need to ask according to God's will, all right? This isn't just speak it into existence. That's nonsense. You have to take the totality of God's word on any given subject, all right? So whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. What is this not? That's right. It's not pleasing before God if you're sinning. You have no assurance and you won't receive anything of Him. Notice He says in verse 23, and this is His commandment. That's in the singular. Entele. That's the Greek word there, the Greek root word entele. It literally means singular commandment. And see, people say, see, it's just one commandment. Here's the commandment. He goes on. That we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandments. So, so they'll see. See? It's just one singular commandment. Keep reading. Verse 24. And he that keepeth His commandments. That's the Greek inflected word, meaning it's the inflection from entele, which is entelos. It's plural. Commandments dwelleth in him and he in him and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us so how do we abide in jesus keeping his commandments how do we dwell in jesus keeping his commandments are we earning it no we didn't earn it however we do play a part in our salvation in this sense we didn't earn it but we must continue to cooperate with the spirit and I'm going to prove it. 
I'm going to prove it. If that sounded like heresy, just stay tuned. I'm going to prove it with the Bible when we get into salvation being synergistic or monergistic. I'm going to give you the Bible that literally proves it. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John is sure, sure, sure powerful. Look at verse 17. You guys hear me quote this so often because, man, it puts a nail in the cop. It's just, I can just say that because I get this so often. You're not like Jesus. Nobody can be like Jesus. Do you know your Bible? 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Not later, not when you get your glorified body. It doesn't say you're made perfect and you stand in boldness in the day of judgment because the blood of Jesus covers me while I sin every single day, but it's okay because I believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I put my trust in Him. You don't even trust in Jesus. Ask them when somebody says, I trust in Jesus alone. Okay. Do you trust that Jesus can deliver you from every single sin and you can walk just like Jesus from here on out? No, you can't do that. Then you don't trust in Jesus. Period. You don't trust in Jesus. You're saying Jesus is too weak to give you the victory. That's blasphemous. That's not what my Bible says. 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Notice it's in the plural again. And His commandments are not grievous. So, newsflash. If Jesus' commandments start to become grievous to you, you probably need to repent because you're probably lukewarm. Or maybe you're dead and deceiving yourself. I mean, if you're lukewarm, you are dead. You're in sin. But think about that. His commandments are not grievous. If they're grievous, there's a problem. You're not currently in Christ. You know how Jesus' commandments become grievous? Here's how it's done. You got one foot in the world, one foot in with Jesus. You're a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. James chapter 1. You're double-minded. That's why it's grievous now. It's not grievous for me to love my wife. It's not grievous for my wife to obey me. Right? Ah, I love her. Same with Jesus. 2 John starting in verse 5. Now, as we read through this, when he talks about those that denied Jesus came in the flesh, he's referring to the Gnostics, because that's what the Gnostics taught, okay? However, the principle still applies. I'll explain that in a minute. Verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I write a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now he's going to define love. Because, okay, well, what is love? He defines it. Verse 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments, which means you're living after Jesus' commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. This is the same writer that wrote, wrote all those verses in 1 John. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver. And an antichrist. That's what the Gnostics were saying. Verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Lose those things which we have wrought. Lose what? Your place in Christ? Ah. That looks like you can be cut off from Christ. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. You see two persons there. You have both the Father and the Son. Right? Now, notice he says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Did Jesus ever tell you to sin? Did Jesus ever, said, ever say, you know, everybody's going to sin every day and you can't help it, just trust in me? No. No, absolutely not. So you're transgressing and you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. So you don't have God. You don't have God. You're deceiving yourself. If there 
come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Don't bid them God speed. If they're transgressing and not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, do not bid them farewell. Don't bid them God speed. Don't even greet them. It looks like you're being rude. No, you're just not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, man. How many false teachers and false doctrines have we dealt with when we're street preaching? Now, at first, I mean, we need to admonish them, try to, you know, because a lot of people are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, are they? But we should contend with them at first to try to open up their eyes. But it, as soon as they start denying clear Bible verses, I don't care what it's about. The once saved, always saved nonsense. We all sin every single day. Baptism is not for the remission of sins whatsoever. All that. Whatever it is. If I show you clear Bible scriptures over and over and over and over again, and you try to argue against it by coming up with your philosophy of men, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. That's it. I love you, but I'm not going to deal with you anymore. Right? They're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Now, some, some people could be blinded, but if they have a humble heart, their eyes can be open to the truth. Deal with these Bible verses I gave you. Deal with them. They say what they say. Don't say you're a Bible-believing Christian when you don't believe the Bible. We sin every day. That's not what my Bible says. Believe the Bible. Don't claim to be a Bible-believing Christian. And then 3 John 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. So you're not to follow evil. Sinning is evil. If you're sinning every day, you're definitely following evil. But that which is good, you follow that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So if you do sin, you don't know God. It's what that's clearly stating. So all these verses I gave you, I could give you many more, they correspond to John chapter 14, verse 21 through 24. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 16. We're going to go through a few more Bible verses as we wrap this up. As you guys are turning there, one time, uh, I, yeah, I was in Tennessee. And I had some Baptists try to use this verse to try to tell me, well, yeah, God will destroy you. He'll kill you and take you to heaven. Well, what am I waiting for? Let's go get drunk. I mean, what? Are you absurd, man? Are you kidding me? God's going to reward you? Because the Baptists that we were dealing with, they believed in once saved, always saved. And I gave them Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. And I think somehow we got on 1 Corinthians chapter 3 here. And they tried to say, well, yeah, you know, if you defile the temple of God, God's going to destroy you. He's going to kill you and take you to heaven. Oh, what? I'm like, so basically, I think I remember st stating, if I go over here and I go get drunk, you're telling me I'm going to go to heaven? That's what they believe. Can you believe that? <clears throat> when my Bible says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, according to their doctrine, think of how dangerous that is. According to their doctrine... Well, by golly, let's go get drunk. Why do I want to stay here? I want to be with Jesus. Think how dangerous that is. That's what happens when you have a preconceived notion and then you read down to the scriptures and you make a fool of yourself because then you're making these bobbers out to say something you don't even say. That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man, any man, even if you profess Christ, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now this Greek root word means to corrupt, to destroy, to lead away from the state of knowledge and holiness in which it ought to abide, this Christian church. To be destroyed, to perish, in an ethical sense, to corrupt, deprave. You're going to be destroyed by God. You're going to perish. 
So notice he says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. You're going to see everlasting destruction. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. For the temple of God is holy. Sin is not holy. So Baptist, you're wrong, or any other person thinking that. The temple of God is holy, not unholy. Holy. Holy means no sin. Okay? Which temple ye are. Notice verse 18, which is even more powerful. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. It's really interesting. He said that right after what he said in verses 16 through 17. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 33. Be not deceived. He's warning you, do not be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Literally meaning evil communion, evil fellowship corrupts good manners, good morals. It will corrupt you. Period. Notice what he says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Stop sinning, no sinning, go and sin no more. Notice what he says right after that, another powerful statement. For some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. They don't have that knowledge. You have no knowledge if you're speaking against that. All right, Romans chapter five. Look at verse 8. I can't remember if I shared this in my previous sermons because we had kind of a break for a little while, so I can't remember. But if I didn't, I'll share it now. Romans 5, verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You were a sinner, not that you still are a sinner. If you're saying you're a sinner... If that's a true statement, you need to repent. You're not in Christ, period. You are supposed to be a past sinner. You were a sinner. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Now this chapter is talking about, doesn't matter what day you observe, you observe it to the Lord, whatever you eat, right? But notice how he wraps it up in verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever. Notice that. That's what I want to get at. Whatsoever. Doesn't matter what it is. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you don't have faith in what you're doing, it is sin to you. Why does that matter if we sin every day? Why write it? Does it matter? That's what I'm getting at. Why put it there? Right. I mean, why, why put it there if we sin every day? So what? Why does that matter, Paul? I sin every day. Because you don't sin. You are not to sin. If you do sin, you confess and repent. The expectation is, go and sin no more. Romans chapter 15. Starting in verse 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. The Greek root word, ergon, meaning work. Another, I know it's like a curse word to, to the evangelical Protestant Christian. Well, why does that matter? Why do the Gentiles have to be obedient? Because you're not to sin. You're to obey Jesus. Romans chapter 16. Starting in verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren. Think about what this is stating now. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now once again, that Greek root word is scandalon. Does anybody remember what scandalon means? Stumbling block. Do not be a stumbling block. 
That's what he's saying. That's where we get our English word scandal, scandalous. So now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. You are to avoid people like that. Now, wait a minute. Why is he saying that if we sin every day? Why does that matter? See? You wouldn't think of using a verse like that. Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They don't even serve Jesus. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Hmm. Think about that for a moment. Mark them. Just kind of put yourself in this perspective right now. Anyone that causes division or stumbling blocks, offenses, you're supposed to mark those. Because it's contrary to the doctrine that they have learned. And notice what he says next. They don't serve Jesus. They serve their own belly. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the, the hearts of the simple. How many pastors, street preachers, and YouTube teachers will come against you for simply believing what the Bible clearly says about any doctrine out there. I don't care what it is. Whether it be God is one God, but three distinct persons, typically referred to as the Trinity. That there is one exception to divorce and remarriage. Only one. That we are to love our enemies. We don't repay evil with evil. We are to repent of our sin. We are to be baptized for the remission of sins. Because that's what my Bible says. That there is a fullness of God that you can receive. Some would call this a baptism of the Holy Ghost. There is a greater infilling of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 3.19 Why is he telling the church at Ephesus that you may be filled with the fullness of God? Why is he telling Christians that already have the Spirit that you may be filled with the fullness if there isn't a greater fullness? Let God be true and every man a liar. I will never cower away at the Word of God. Anybody coming against clear Scripture is deceived. I don't care who it is. If I do it, you are not to believe that. I would expect you to talk to me. Right? You don't rebuke an elder, 1 Timothy 5.1, but this is an upbraiding, scornful approach. But I could be off on something, couldn't I? I don't know everything. That's why, even though I'm in this position, the hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need from you, for you, right? Even y'all younger in the face, sometimes you make some really good points. I can't say I have no need for you. Oh, don't, don't you know I've been in the faith much longer than you? Who are you peon to correct me? That's not my heart. It will never be my heart. God forbid it. Notice verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. This is the basics. And notice your obedience. Why does that matter? See, you would read these verses and you wouldn't think salvation from sin. But there it is. There it is. Galatians chapter 6. Starting in verse 7. We're kind of going in order a little bit to kind of make it easy for you guys. Be not deceived. Once again, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Boy, the world likes to use that, right? I wonder where they got that from. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. This literally means destruction. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. 
would the Holy Spirit ever lead you to sin against God? No. That's salvation from sin. Once again, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Starting in verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Why does that, why is he even saying that if we're all a bunch of sinners that sin all the time? That makes no sense, but it does make sense if there's salvation from sin and one happens to sin, correct? Yeah. Sinners in the church cast out. That's right. Sinners in the church that will not repent. They refuse to repent. They are to be outside the camp, outside the congregation. They're to be a publican and a heathen to us. Them that sin rebuke before all that also the others may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Do you hear that? So I'm not to show partiality. Period. Doesn't it say in Proverbs differing weights is an abomination before God? I must treat all men the same. It doesn't matter how much I had a personal relationship with this person over here. If they're coming against the Bible, they're deceived. God is not a respecter of persons. That's right. God is not a respecter of persons. If you're coming against the Bible verses, if you're sinning, if you're doing anything that is in error, wrong, I am not to treat you any different. Period. I love you, but I'm not to treat you any different. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Why does that matter? How Keep yourself pure. We're not pure. Oh, wait a minute. We're pure because the blood of Jesus covers us, but we're still sinning every day. And God the Father looks down from heaven and sees Jesus on us, even though we're sinning every day because the blood covers me. That's what people try to tell you today. But why is he saying neither be partaker of other men's sins unless you're expected to not sin? Keep thyself pure. All right? The right there shows you salvation from sin. James chapter 1, starting in verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So he tells you, don't just hear the word, do the word. Or else you'll deceive yourself. And notice he says, lay apart all filthiness. That's all your sin. All of it. He doesn't say try. He doesn't say try your best. Just try. He doesn't say most of it because you're still going to sin. No, he says lay, up, lay aside all of your filthiness. All of your naughtiness. That's salvation from sin. Go to James chapter 2. Look at verse 14. What are the prophet, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? That's a rhetorical question. If you say you have faith in Jesus, can your faith save you? What he's essentially asking is, can faith alone save you? Well, he goes on and explains it cannot. Right? Go down to verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without that works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I show you my faith by my works. It's evident by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O foolish man, O vain man, O foolish man, meaning devoid of truth, that faith without works is dead. O vain man. That's interesting. O vain man. It means you're devoid, empty of truth. He goes on, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, wait a minute. Was Abraham justified by his faith? Yeah. Did Abraham obey God as soon as God spoke to him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5? Yeah, that was a work. But he, he was justified at that point by his faith with his works right from day one. Yet, notice he says, he was justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now, wait a minute. Think about that. So, you need to continue in the justification. Right? You continue in it. 
If he wouldn't have offered his son Isaac upon the altar, would he have still stayed justified? No. Oh, so you're, okay. oh, however you want to term it, you won't be justified any longer if you don't obey God. Use that verse where it talks about Jacob's favorite God looks as dead. But then I guess another person down below the coming years month, he's like, yeah, I agree with that. But it's before men. It's not before God. Doesn't say that. <laughs> right? Like, they were talking about it's justification before men, but not justification before that, God. Because I've heard that before. <laughs> it's just so absurd, man. It's the same arguments that we see with people arguing against baptism, arguing against a fullness of God, arguing against spiritual gifts, because the Bible clearly teaches spiritual gifts, right? Absolutely. And by the way, for you that exalt tongues, which is great, right? But prophecy is greater. Can we just get back to believing the Bible? Whether it's about baptism, the fullness of God, uh, the topic of baptism, having salvation from sin. Can we just believe the Bible? Why, why do I need to hear your man-made explanation? Let's just believe the Bible. Now look, God has point, appointed teachers, right? I'm teaching. I'm expounding upon the Word, but do, I don't go against the Word. I don't do that. God forbid I ever do that. And then I've heard that, brother. I mean, I've heard people, well, see, that's just, that's just justification before men. No, it's not. That's, and you know, that's so absurd. Who commanded him to bring Isaac upon the altar? Was there any other men around? No. Absurdity. It's just Abraham and his son. Absurdity. Notice he goes on. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, meaning accounted unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 14? Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Notice it says he was called the friend of God. Would he still have been the friend of God if he wouldn't have obeyed God? No. Ye see then how that by works. I know that's, I know this is like a, a heretical Bible verse right here. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The only time you ever see faith and alone put together is the very Bible verse saying you're not justified by faith alone. Because in the Greek where it says faith only, it means alone in the Greek. Only alone. Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You don't even have faith in Jesus if you don't have works from what day? Day five? No, day one. The very first minute God speaks to you or you receive the gospel. I mean, it's just, this, this stuff is just, it's so elementary. It really is. It's the elementary principle foundations of the faith. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Think about this Bible verse. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Not ungodliness, godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You're not virtuous sinning against God. Whereby are given unto us, this is given unto us, exceeding great and precious promises. What are they? He goes on. That by these ye might, why does it say might? Because it's conditioned upon you obeying. That ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice you escaped the corruption that is in the world. You escaped your sin. You left the filth of Egypt, which is a picture of sin, that ye might be partakers of the divine nature. If the divine nature is living inside of you, it means you have victory and power over all sin. You can walk like Jesus. Now, the last few I want to get to, go to 1 Thessalonians. Starting in verse 1. We'll put the nail in the coffin right here. Brother Jamari mentioned 
uh, how people try to define grace. And we, you know, in this doctrinal series on soteriology, we actually have sermon on grace. But let's refresh ourselves, shall we? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. For y'all that think you can't have salvation from sin, and that sanctification is a process, which you'll never see in the Bible. It says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So Paul was teaching them the commandments of the Lord to obey them. And he said, look, you, you received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. Why does that matter if we sin every day? Right? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So here's sanctification. That ye should abstain from fornication. That means you're not committing fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not dishonor, honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. They don't know God. They don't walk like you. We are separate from them. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. And we also have forewarned you and testified. For God, listen up, for God hath not called us unto uncleanliness. God, that's literally stating God has not called us to sin, but unto holiness. Listen up, for all of y'all that disagree with salvation from sin, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. So if you despise what I'm telling you, if you reject it, that's literally what it means. You reject God. You don't reject me. You reject God. All I've given you is Bible verses and expounding on it a little bit. Very clear what it's stating here. Now we know Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. We know this one. We quote it so often. Jamari brought up the grace of God here. It clearly says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, you're denying sin, you're not still sinning, and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's right now. Boy, that sounds a lot like 1 John 4, 17. Love is perfected in us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as Jesus is, so are we in this world right now. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. Now, this redeem in the Greek, it means a deliverance. That he might redeem, i.e. deliver us from all iniquity, all sin, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice right after that he says, These things speak. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Don't let anybody despise you. Rebuke them. Now, go with me. Last one. It's in Jude. Jude verse 4. We're going to look at a few Bible verses here in Jude. Now that we see the grace of God delivers us from all of our sin, and we live soberly, righteously, and godly right now, we deny all ungodliness, all sin. And we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that sanctification is living godly right now. It's abstaining from fornication, right? We live godly right now. Now compare that to Jude verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. Why are they ungodly? Let's see. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says these people are ungodly. Why? Because they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. It literally means a license to sin. Now, Look down there in verse 14. Now, why does this matter if we sin every day? Notice what this says. 
And Enoch also, by the way, if you didn't know this, he's quoting from the book of Enoch. I'm not saying it's scripture. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Just don't hyperventilate if you heard that on YouTube. But he is quoting from the book of Enoch. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Doesn't say sinners. Says saints. To execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, their works, which they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These, the same people he's talking about, are murmurers, complainers. Do you complain? Ah, oh, we got to examine ourselves. Are we complaining about things? Now, there's a difference between stating a fact. I do that with my wife. But don't complain. Don't gripe about it. Oh, why, God? Why? Notice, murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ? How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts? These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. Having not the Spirit. So all these people, now notice when, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with his saints, not with sinners. So why are you calling yourself a sinner? I mean, I'm just taking it at your word. If you're a sinner, you're not a saint. You're not of God. <clears throat> and by the way, this would correlate with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, that the saints shall judge the world and we shall judge angels. I don't know how exactly all that works, but it says what it says, and I believe it. Like a little child. Go figure. Shocking. But notice he comes with ten thousands of his saints. And he executes judgment upon all. Now, how can you be part of the Lord, executing judgment upon all, when you don't belong there? You need to be judged. It wouldn't make any sense for sinners to judge sinners. It'd be hypocritical. No, we're going to come back with him to execute judgment upon all, to convict all who are ungodly among them. You're not ungodly. You're following the Lord as a saint, not sinning. They are ungodly. And notice, they're murmurs, complainers, they walk in their own lust, they're sinning every day, they have no salvation from sin. So with that, we will conclude this sermon today. That the Bible clearly shows you salvation from sin. If you have no salvation from sin, you have no salvation. Period. Let no man deceive you. Once again probably for the third time today, let God be true and every man a liar. With that, I will open up the floor to the men in here if they have anything to add, object to, or any questions. Um, that will conclude salvation from sin. Now, to remind you, we will be getting into what is the gospel still. Uh, can a Christian be worthy? The Lord added that to me. Salvation, whether it's monergistic or synergistic, we'll go through several sermons on that. And uh, for all I know, the Lord may add another one or two. I think the Lord may be adding to me, can we save ourselves? So, go ahead, brother. Yeah, so I just wanted to expound a little more on um, those hating a brother are walking in darkness. So, the Bible says in 1 John 1, verses 5, like you said, um, God, God is light and in Him is no darkness, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in the next, um, or in, the, in the same book, in chapter 4, verses 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love, right? Right. And so if you go to... go to Romans 13 verses 8 through 10 it says Owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law 
For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And notice here in verse 10, it says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. That no, that uh, worketh no ill is no sin to your neighbor. Right. Because he just listed off sins there. So right. Hating your brother isn't the only sin that's going to put you in darkness. It's that's all right. sin. And we know from our Lord Jesus Christ that the two greatest commandments that fulfills the whole law is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. So. Yeah. I also, um, also wanted to read First John two nine because it says, "He that saith that." Is in a light, hit it. Well, oh, actually, yeah, that's the one I was covering. Never mind. So that's no, you're good. So, real quick, I want to add some flavor to what you said there. Where it says, Love worketh no ill in Romans chapter 13, I believe that's verse 10, right? Yeah, verse 10. The Greek root word literally means this of bad nature, of a mode of thinking, feeling, acting, troublesome, injurious, pernicious, destructive, baneful. So, it is sinful, right? So, if you do commit a sin against your brother, your neighbor, even a neighbor, repent. Yep. Confess and repent. Just humble yourself and get back to abiding in Jesus Christ. There's, go ahead. You got to give him the mic. Well, there's something else I was going to say. Oh, go ahead. So since we we're talking about grace, I wanted to read from Genesis 6 of how Noah, um, Noah found grace, right? Mm -hmm. So it says in Genesis 6, Verses 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, right? But then it says in verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of, of the Lord. Verse 9, it says, These are a generation of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. So how did Noah find grace in God's eyes? He was a righteous man. He walked with God. That's right. That's, that's a good one, brother. Yeah, actually, he's going to use the speaker, so it really doesn't have to be right next to it, but go ahead. Please bear with me. John Piper is semi-Gnostic by saying he has sin, and counted as if he doesn't. This is quite similar to Gnostic dualism. They believed they would commit sins in the flesh, but be free from sin in the spirit. This was a heresy of the early church. Satan has convinced people they are on a train headed for heaven while they are riding the rails toward hell. Yep. They need to repent and get off the devil's train. The Samaritans were born again and water baptized and were not filled with the Holy Ghost until afterward. Yep. Cornelius received Holy Spirit baptism before being water baptized. Many will claim, these are only one-time occurrences. Nothing in the text suggests that. I think we see both, so we realize either scenario is possible. God decides. I think most cases follow the Samaritan model. I think the Cornelius model is more rare. I came in under the Cornelius model I was born again, and Holy Spirit baptized many years before my water baptism. So I know these occurrences still take place today. There seems to be an unspoken rule of hermeneutics among many churches today. If at any point the Bible does not agree with your doctrine, redefine it to force it to agree, or right. sidestep and fully ignore it. That's right. Redirect people to verses you can easily turn to fit your doctrine. I say this because all these men claim they practice good hermeneutics, and they yet do these things. That's right. Jesus was clear. If we deny any of his words, then you aren't saved. Jesus said, sin no more. He also said to keep his commandments. He also said to be perfect. They seek to redefine all these words, thereby rejecting his actual words. They bring damnation upon themselves. That's right. It is vitally important to simply believe the Bible by what it literally says. An interesting point about 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is more specifically addressing elders. So if it is found out an elder actually is in sin. Rebuke before all. Of course, we would need to be absolutely certain. Yep. Which is why it takes two witnesses. This means even pastors are not guaranteed they can't fall away into condemnation. Right. Many churches, even those that teach turning from sin and seeking holiness. It seems common that they treat the idea of moral perfection as some sort of plague. As if God is worried that someone would actually seek to be pleasing to him all the time it is simply a logical disconnect. What would be wrong to be free from sin? This was the mission of Jesus. To set his people free from their sins. I must conclude the doctrines of men blind them from what the Bible actually says. That is all I have thank you for listening. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah, for y'all on YouTube, <clears throat> once again, to remind you, Brother Tracy does not have a voice box, so you will hear him use technology to communicate. Um, that's right, what he pointed out there, that 1 Timothy 5.19. Notice right before that says, Against an elder receive not an accusation. You are not to receive an accusation from anybody except but before two or three witnesses. Because there's a higher standard for the one behind the pulpit, the pastor, the fellowship. Uh, although you don't, you don't have to be behind the pulpit teaching to be a bishop. You know, Brother John, he, you know, rarely, rarely teaches. So, and that's fine. So, why, once again, why would that matter? I mean, if everybody's sinning every day, right? And we, I think we read previously that the bishops are to be blameless, and so are de deacons. So. Well, if you're sinning every day, if you're sinning at all, you're not blameless. Now, does that mean I've never sinned since I've been a Christian? No, I'm not saying that. Most of the time it's ignorance. You know, I do something and afterwards the Lord's like, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, he may point out, so it could be like five days later, right? And the Lord may refresh my memory of Keith. You could have handled that better, right? And if he does that, I, I repent, you know? That's something after the fact that the Lord's teaching me. Willful sin would be you have knowledge of it, like, I know not to lie. Well, I'm going to lie. I know I should be taking care of others. Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to be selfish. Right? Those are sins of commission and sins of omission. Right? Anyway, go ahead. I just want to say, so many churches out there speak directly against Jesus. They say, Hey, he only uses the law to set you up so that you know that you need his righteousness. Right. They'll even use that verse where Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, oh, he just wants you to know that you can't live up to the standard so that you know you need his righteousness. Right. But I will tell you, if you search the entire four gospels, you will not find one verse where Jesus says, hey, listen, I was just setting you guys up so that you understand that you can't do it, take this from me right. and I'll give it to you. You went through, I don't know how many verses in John 14, John 15, I don't even think you got half of the verses where Jesus said, keep my commandments. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, he, he gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. He gives, he's the author of the salvation of those who obey him. Right. Right. He who loves me keeps my commandments. Right. I mean, you literally can't walk away and think that he only wants you to know that you can't live up to his standard. Right. Right. There's, there's nothing in there at all. Uh, another thing, uh, Jamari mentioned the guy said about the James chapter, mm -hmm. saying that, oh, um, you know, that was just to justify yourself before men. Right. But Jesus himself, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, and went by a step-by-step -step process on how and what way that righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. And one of the very things he said was not to do your good deeds in front of men as to be seen by them, as to be looking for the credit for men, which makes that verse from James in no way possible can that mean that's only justification before men. Yeah, it doesn't even say that at all. It's not in the text. That's right. Anyone yeah, I mean, yeah, what, uh, yeah, what, what he said there, you know, it's, it's, uh, it. it is correct because the Lord is expecting you to obey him. Now, look, I, there's, there's some things I could do without Jesus, right? I, I'll tell you, there's some things I could do without Jesus. I, I could, I could not tell oaths, right? Not not give in to any oath, right? I, I could not I could choose not to swear upon a Bible or whatever, give a vow, get, give give oaths. I, I could do that. You know, I could do some things without Jesus. But there are some things I can't do without him. To go the rest of my life and never lust again. Man, I need a power of Jesus for that because I used to be quite lustful. To go the rest of my life and Love my enemies? There ain't no way, man. Not without Jesus. Because if somebody struck my wife right in front of me, the old me, we get in the flesh really fast, man. 
right? I mean, I, I carried around a concealed handgun, man. You ain't gonna think there was there was no love in my enemy. I would have fought back in a heartbeat. Now I fight back spiritually. We're not pacifists. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Second Corinthians ten. So, you know, I know I know what these people are doing. Well, the, he's just using the law. To, well, first off, he's not. He's showing he's showing that there's there's a change here, like Hebrews seven twelve says, by the. Uh, with the changing of the priesthood by necessity there's a change of the law he was bringing in the new covenant now the gospel we know was first preached to Abraham but he was bringing in the new covenant and you can look at his commandments like wow love my and love these Romans you want us to love these Romans when they're beating up on us and taxing us to death and and they, they denied it a lot of them denied that but yeah, people will do that and say, well, see, it just shows you, you know, he's using the law to show you that you need to be covered in the blood and you need to have the grace of Jesus. And well, yeah, it shows your need for Jesus. I'm not disputing that. However, he's expecting you to obey him, period. And you, you do it in the power of God. He doesn't give the Holy Spirit for you so, you so you get just tingly wingly feelings like, oh, God, oh, God, this is, this is so awesome, God. Thank you so much. Oh. No, he's giving you the Holy Spirit to walk in the power of God and to use you as a testimony to evangelize others, to walk in that power of God. Right? Go ahead. Yeah, just like I said, as we're ending this, I just, I want to end up with this. Um, when I read the Bible, I like to go off of hermeneutics. F what you're reading, if it makes sense, let it make perfect sense, and take no other sense, lest you make nonsense. Right. The Bible says what it says. Right. That's just it. It's just, it's not, it's not room for interpretation. But scriptures, uh, I don't know if it's first or second Peter, but it talks mm -hmm. about scripture, it says, it's not up for private interpretation, right. it's by the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes it abundantly clear. He says, be perfect. Right. Matthew 5 48 he says be perfect now when you read the context and when he's talking about what it means to be morally perfect he says be perfect he means morally perfect not right. intellectually perfect physically perfect mentally perfect right. not like the world standard of perfection but he's saying be morally right. perfect be, be morally complete perfect. totally in him right, right. so it's, when he had to be preaching he, was, he said he said this one thing which I actually totally agree with and it had to maybe kind of reflect not like saying because I was still sinning but I was like he actually made a very good point he said what sin can't you stop doing? Right. What sin can't you stop doing? And I looked and I'm like, he's right. Every anytime I lied, I did not have to lie. Whenever I stole something, I did not have to steal. When I had filthy cuss words come out my mouth, I didn't have to say those words. Right. I could have said something else. I don't have to sin. That's right. Sin is a choice. That's right. I don't have to sin. So I was like. God doesn't. God does not command the impossible. He commands the possible. You don't have to sin. And you think about that. Wicked. That that God in your head and it got in your heart and you believe it. Right. That's trusting in Jesus, believing it, right? And He gives you the power. He, he. I mean, He told the apostles, "I will not leave you alone. I will give you the Comforter." Like I said, this isn't for our. our you know, oh, I got tingly wingly feelings. Oh, it feels so awesome. You know, it's not for that. Do I like the feelings? Yeah. I love when God moves upon me even more, man. It's awesome. But I don't live, I don't walk my Christian walk by feelings. That's deceptive. Because there are days you may wake up, me and John talked about this, where it's like the hordes of hell are on your back, man. Everything's against you, right? Man, if I walked by my feelings, I'd be like this. But I don't walk by my feelings. We walk by faith, not by sight. I think that's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And when you look at the Greek, it's based upon another Greek word. You know, etymolo the etymology of that word is based upon another word, literally meaning your senses. We walk by faith. The power of God. Anybody else? Any other men? All right, till next week.